Have you ever known a very zealous person? I'd like to share a little story with you about a nurse named Patsy. When Patsy was a student nurse, one of her jobs was to assist patients who were being discharged from the hospital by pushing them in a wheelchair to the front door. Usually, patients complied, but not always. As she entered one patient's room, she found an older man sitting up on the side of the bed, fully dressed, with a suitcase by his feet. When she offered to wheel him down to the front door, he resisted, saying that he didn't need any assistance. But it's our hospital policy, Patsy said. Rules are rules and you must comply with them. Grudgingly, the gentleman complied. Making small talk along the way, Patsy asked, will your wife be meeting you outside? I don't know, the man said. She's still in her room changing out of her hospital gown. I can't help but wonder how often we, in our own zeal, end up unnecessarily offending or hurting others or even ourselves. Now, this word zeal, this might not be a word that we use in our everyday vocabulary, but it's definitely a word that, that we know. It's definitely a word that we understand. Right? We can all imagine the, the successful salesman with a lot of zeal, a lot of energy, the one who influenced your decision to purchase that extended warranty. We are all familiar with the zeal of that little boy who attacks his toy cleanup with renewed enthusiasm after his parents promise him ice cream. So this zeal, this energetic and, and relentless pursuit of something isn't inherently a bad thing. But if zeal is misplaced, it can be a terrible thing. Think about the misplaced zeal of the Jehovah's Witnesses who will come knocking on your door within the upcoming months. Or what about the misplaced zeal of those radical Muslims who strapped explosive belts onto themselves on Palm Sunday and went to two churches and carried out suicide bombings in Egypt? Misplaced zeal can be deadly. So how can we be sure that the things that we're zealous for are are good? How can we know that our zealous pursuits aren't dangerous or harmful to ourselves or to others? And these are some of the questions that the Apostle Paul is going to answer for us today. We're going to look in Romans chapter 9, verse 30, to the beginning of chapter 10, verse 4. And in this passage, we're going to learn that our most zealous pursuit should be Jesus. Our most zealous pursuit should be Jesus. Let's look at our passage this morning, starting in Romans 9, 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame." Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So we're in this series in Romans chapters 9 through 11 that we're calling The Chosen, and we've been exploring the sometimes confusing relationships between the Jews and God, the Jews and the gospel, and the Jews and Gentile believers. And so far in chapter 9, we've looked at salvation from God's perspective, his sovereignty in selecting Abraham and and the, the Jewish nation and Israel. As, as the ones through whom the world would be blessed, as the ones through whom the prophets would come, as the ones through whom our Old Testament would arise, and ultimately as the ones through whom Jesus, the Messiah, would come. And last week, we continued looking at salvation from God's perspective as it was his amazing grace that draws both Jews and Gentiles into his kingdom. Now, Paul flips over the coin of salvation. See, on one side of the coin of salvation is God's grace from his perspective, and on the other side is salvation from our perspective. We've, Paul has been explaining so far God's grace from the position of God's uh, calling or electing people into his kingdom. And now, at uh, Romans 9.30, he turns it. 
He explains God's grace from the position of people making the decision to follow him. So it's in this next part of Romans where Paul begins explaining that we are responsible for trusting in Christ, that our most zealous pursuit should be, should be Jesus. And why? Why should our most zealous pursuit be Jesus? Well, verses 30 to 33 of chapter 9 give us the first reason why. The first reason why we should be passionate about following Jesus is because pursuing him leads to salvation. Pursuing Jesus leads to salvation. Let's look again at these verses, 30 to 33. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So in these verses, Paul is contrasting a righteousness that is received by faith with a so-called righteousness that is received by the law. He's explaining that Gentiles are flowing into the kingdom of God because they've embraced a righteousness that is based on faith in Christ. But Israel, on the other hand, has failed to enjoy the blessings of messianic salvation because she's been preoccupied with pursuing a righteousness based on works. In verse 31, when Paul says that Israel pursued a law that would lead to righteousness... He's using shorthand here for the mistaken idea that the law of Moses could somehow enable a person to get right with God. From Paul's first century perspective, Israel was treating the law of Moses as if it offered a right relationship with God by works. From his perspective, the majority of the first century Jews were acting as if the law was all about what they needed to do, when in actuality it was all about trusting and responding in surrender to what God had done. And what had God done? He gave them the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 32, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Now here in verse 33, Paul's quoting from our Old Testament prophet Isaiah, and he's drawing us a picture here of what he's talking about, and the images of a person walking so intently in pursuit of a specific goal that he stumbles and falls over a rock lying right in the path. And what Paul's saying is that Israel, while she was passionate and focused on the law and all of its demands, she missed Jesus Christ, the stone that God had placed in her path. Remember here that Paul is speaking in a, of Israel in a general sense. Though many Jews have responded in Jesus to faith, and Paul was one of them, still the great majority haven't. And let's not think for, for one second that Israel is the only one to stumble over Jesus. All humanity is on this path streaming right toward the stone. And as long as anyone is pursuing salvation as if it's something that can be achieved or earned, they'll stumble and fall when confronted with Christ. You see, Jesus is either the savior that you'll set your life upon, or he's the stone that you'll stumble over. You can stumble over him and fall headfirst into destruction, or you can pursue him as the promised Messiah who came to redeem you. So our most zealous pursuit should be Jesus. Pursuing him leads to salvation, and the second reason why we should pursue him is because pursuing Jesus gives rise to compassion. Let's look at verse 1 of Romans 10. Paul writes, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. They, he's talking about Israel. See, we have to remember just how much all of this matters to Paul. He's deeply affected because he sees his Jewish brothers and sisters stumbling over the only one who can save them. When Paul says that his prayer for Israel is that they may be saved, he's using a word for prayer. The word is desis. And what it means is it, it, it conveys the idea of pleading, of a heartfelt petition to God. See, Paul's deep grief at their unbelief moves him to pray fervently. And he's not just flippantly throwing around the word prayer here. He's praying passionately because he fully believed that God would save all Israel if they would turn to Christ in faith. 
See, Paul is emotionally invested in their salvation and he has absolute compassion on them. You see, as he pursued Jesus more and more, Paul was driven to a place of compassion for the lost, especially for Israel. Now, if we're going to be honest here, we have to admit that the church throughout history hasn't always done a stellar job in being known for her compassion. In fact, the church has had a particularly awful track record with her relationship with the Jews. Some of the most admired church fathers were some of the most anti-Semitic people. And to illustrate this, I just want to look at a couple quotes. So here's a part of one. I'll read it. I'll read the full quote here. The quote is, the Jews are the most worthless of all men. They worship the devil. Their religion is a sickness. The synagogue is worth is worse than a brothel. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf and an abyss of perdition. I would say the same things about their souls. God always hated the Jews. It is incumbent upon all Christians to hate the Jews. I hate the Jews for the very same reason. And this was spoken toward the late fourth century by a missionary known for his eloquent and uncompromising preaching, a man who's now often considered one of the the greatest church, a guy by the name of John Chrysostom. Let me read one more. Another guy wrote this. Let me give you my honest advice. Their synagogues or churches should be set on fire, and this ought to be done for the honor of God and of Christianity in order that God may see that we are Christians. Their homes should be broken down and destroyed. They should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmuds in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught. Their rabbis must be forbidden under the threat of death to teach anymore. Passport and traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to Jews. Let them stay at home. Everything they possess, they stole and robbed from us. May we all be free from this insufferable, devilish burden. The Jews... Now, the man who carried these things out almost to the letter was Adolf Hitler, but he did not write these. Actually, they were written 400 years earlier by the very same man responsible for the reformation of the church, Martin Luther. Now, I'm sharing these not not to attack these men who have made tremendous contributions to the church in so many other areas, but I'm sharing this to illustrate that we, the church, the body of Christ, the ones called to bring the gospel of hope and life to a hopeless and lost world, we of all people should be known for our compassion and our love. One pastor during the Nazi regime grew to understand this. A guy by the name of Martin Niemuller. He was a German Lutheran pastor. He initially supported Adolf Hitler, but soon became convinced that Hitler's ideology and scripture's theology were in complete opposition with one another. After Hitler was in office for a few years, Martin was arrested because of his opposition, and he was sent to one of the concentration camps in Germany. He barely escaped execution and ended up being released in 1945. After his release, he expressed deep regret about not having done enough, not having been compassionate enough to help the victims of the Nazis. And here's what he said. This is a well-known quote. He said this. He said, the Nazis came first for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I was not a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak up because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the Catholics, and I was a Protestant, so I didn't speak up. Then they came for me. By that time, there was no one to speak up for anyone. So let me ask you, when was the last time you pleaded with God for the salvation of a Jewish friend? When's the last time you cried out to God for any of your neighbors or for your coworker who who stands against everything that you stand for? Can you say in all honesty that your heart's desire and your prayer to God is for the salvation of those around you? Let's never forget that this church Bayside Chapel exists for the sole purpose of bringing glory to God by leading people into fruitful relationships with Christ. The moment we fail to lead people to Jesus, the moment we stop making disciples, we become nothing more than a country club with a bunch of programs and some really cool music. 
God has called us to be fishers of men, not keepers of the aquarium. The time to go to a lost world with the love of Christ is now. So will we have a heart like Paul burdened for the lost? Will we pray for them? Will we tell them about the love of the Father? Now, from a practical standpoint, what can you do with this? If you're not quite sure how to share your faith, or maybe you're not that confident, then in the fall, when our groups and classes launch again, commit to joining the Intro to Evangelism class. That's a great class. Or if you have some Jewish friends or coworkers that you want to share Christ with, mark your calendars for June 23rd, that's the fourth Friday in June, because our very own Gary and Liz Cohen are going to share a bit about their Jewish background and their coming to faith in Jesus. And they're also going to equip us with some tools in, in witnessing to our Jewish friends. Our most zealous pursuit should be Jesus. Pursuing him leads to salvation. It gives rise to compassion. And the third reason why we should passionately follow Jesus is because pursuing him brings about knowledge. Pursuing Jesus brings about knowledge. Look at what Paul says in verses two and three. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. See, though the, the Jews are zealous for God, their zeal isn't according to knowledge. And by knowledge here, Paul means uh, knowledge of spiritual truth or knowledge of what God has revealed to be true. And we learn two things about this knowledge. First is that knowledge of the truth is an antidote to misplaced zeal. See, Paul knew all about the great effort and time the Jewish people have put into having a right relationship with God. He knew all of the things that they sacrificed in order to please God. After all, he was a former Pharisee. He was a, re- a Jewish religious leader, so he knew this. But the problem, Paul says, is that their zeal was not according to knowledge. See, you can be absolutely sincere about something, but you can still be sincerely wrong. And that's what Paul's saying about Israel as a whole. Though they're zealous, their zeal is not based on truth. And since it's not based on truth, it's eternally useless. And this isn't only true of the Jews, it's true of every single person who holds to any beliefs that do not align with God's revealed word. The truth of your belief is more important than than how enthusiastically or passionately you hold to that belief. You know, the very definition of a fanatic is a person with extreme zeal or enthusiasm. But I like the way one person defined a, a fanatic. It was defined this way. A fanatic is a person who, having lost sight of his goal, redoubles his effort to get there. A fanatic is a person who, having lost sight of his goal, redoubles his effort to get there. Now, if you're a mom or dad with toddlers or young kids at home, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your house always looks like you're losing a game of Jumanji or something. Right, you, you go to the kitchen, you start loading and unloading the dishwasher while your kids are in the family room throwing around the couch cushions and the pillows. Then you go into the family room to put back the couch cushions and the pillows and then your kids go in the kitchen and start tossing around all the spoons and Tupperware. You got nowhere. Then they do the same thing by tossing around all the clothes you just folded and by throwing all their food on the floor you just cleaned. You get nowhere. By the end of the day, you feel like you work twice as hard as normal with nothing to show for it. You're like a fanatic running around frantically getting nowhere. As you can tell, I have toddlers at home. (laughs) And this isn't unlike the religious person with misplaced zeal. If you're a religious person trying to make progress and pleasing God, thinking that your enthusiasm and your zeal are enough, you need to know that you're getting nowhere and when it's all said and done, you're going to spend an eternity separated from God. So fix your eyes on Christ because as you do, you'll grow in your knowledge of the truth. Knowledge of the truth is an antidote to misplaced zeal and knowledge of the truth is an antidote to misguided righteousness. Look again at verse three. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. 
See, all of the hard work and zeal of Israel was based on the false presumption that religious rituals, good works, morality, and strict law-keeping were sufficient for being made right with God. Like Paul says, they were ignorant of the righteousness of God. They were ignorant of it, not because it wasn't revealed to them, it absolutely was, they were ignorant of it because what does Paul say next? Because they sought to establish their own righteousness. In other words, they were self-righteous because Israel was self-righteous, holding her own righteousness above the righteousness of God. She didn't submit to his righteousness. And that's what's so deadly about self-righteousness is that it blinds men and women to his righteousness. You see, we humans have this awful tendency to to press our spirituality into the mold of our everyday experiences and our everyday achievements. If you think about it, it's easy for us to to kind of view life as a series of accomplishments or achievements, one after the other, things that, that we're proud of achieving or things that others praise us for. If I asked you to tell me three things in your life that you were most excited about, many of them would likely have to do with some sort of accomplishment, something you achieved something others praised you for. If you're a kid, maybe it was that time you scored that goal in soccer and you were praised by your parents and your teammates and your coaches. For the teenager, it might be your high scores on the SATs or that 45 kill streak in Call of Duty. For the young adult, maybe it was that time that you graduated college. Maybe it was that that time you landed your first job after college. Guys, maybe it was that day when your wife said, I do. Or maybe it was that day that you got that job promotion that you, were, that you wanted so b- badly. Ladies, maybe it was that flawless, hallmark quality Christmas where you cooked and hosted for 25 people and everything was perfect and everybody was perfectly satisfied. Or, or, or that time that you gave birth to your child and everyone praised you for being such a trooper through it. And you had 945 likes on the baby's first Facebook picture. Now you see where I'm going with this. None of these are, are bad in any way. Most of them are beautiful things deserving of praise and encouragement. But the point is this, because we live such accomplishment-driven and, and performance-fueled lives, we tend to take the same mentality and squeeze our spirituality into it. And this is why people are so addicted to working for their own salvation, their own righteousness. They begin to think that, that they're good enough, that they can do enough good things so that God will look down on them and say, I am so proud of you, you've done enough, now you can be saved. The Jews were guilty of this, and every religious and moral person who hasn't believed in the name of Christ is guilty of this. This is why your most zealous pursuit should be Jesus. If you pursue him, you'll find salvation. As you pursue Jesus, you'll learn to be more and more compassionate. And as you pursue him, you'll grow in your knowledge of the truth. And the final reason why our most zealous pursuit should be Jesus is because pursuing him results and freedom. Let's look at verse four, chapter 10. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. See, what Israel failed to grasp and what every religious person, what every moralist, what every self-righteous person fails to grasp is that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And when Paul says that Christ is the end of the law here, he means that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law of Moses. He's the goal to which the law pointed. Everything, the very same righteousness that our Old Testament defined, Jesus came and perfectly demonstrated. Why is this important? It's it's important because the righteousness that the law demanded, Jesus not only came and demonstrated, he also offers it to sinful people, as Paul says, to everyone who believes. It's offered to us on the basis of faith. And this is how we are saved. This is the only way to be saved for the Jew, for the Muslim, for the Catholic, for the skeptic, for everyone. When we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting him as our savior from sin and our leader for life, God credits our account with Jesus' righteousness. And no longer do we cower before God as condemned sinners. We now stand in confidence as much loved sons and daughters of the king. 
And when, we, when you walk with God as a child walks hand in hand with her daddy, you have total freedom and you have absolutely nothing to fear. You're free from the demands of the law. You're free from rote religious rituals. You're free from the exhausting attempts of trying to earn a right standing with God. And you're free from constantly trying to prove your worth and your acceptance to God. And listen, this is just as true for the believer as it is for the unbeliever. If you're already a follower of Jesus, stop thinking that your continued value and your worth is dependent upon what you do or what you don't do. Remind yourself that everything that you need is already yours in Christ. See, we sometimes forget this. We're sometimes like like the person who searches everywhere for their car keys, only to realize that the keys have been in your pocket the whole time. This is how one author describes it. He wrote it like this. At least twice in the past year, I've been late for a meeting or an appointment and haven't been able to find my car keys. Certain that either my wife or one of my children had misplaced them, I frantically run from room to room assigning blame. Who was playing with my keys? I put them right here on the counter and now they're gone. They didn't just vanish into thin air. Who picked them up? Where are they? I'm late. And right when I'm about ready to order mass executions, I walk into my bedroom one last time to look, huffing and puffing, moaning and groaning, put my hand in my pocket and find my keys. They'd been there the whole time. See, the truth is, many of us who follow Jesus are like this, frantically and frustratingly searching for something that we already have. The gospel is God's good news announcement that everything we need, we already possess in Christ. Because of Jesus' finished work, we already have all of the justification, all of the approval, the significance, the security, the freedom, the validation, the love, the righteousness, the approval, everything that we need, everything that we desperately long for, we already have in Christ. But we sometimes still look for these things in a thousand other things infinitely smaller than Jesus. We allow our internal voice, the one that says, do this and live, to drown out the external voice that shouts, it is finished. And listen, for all of you Christ followers, your value and your worth, God's love for you is not dependent upon what you do or what you don't do. It's dependent upon who he is and whose you are. And if you're not yet a follower of Christ, please understand that you can't earn a right standing with God. So stop exhausting yourself by trying. It's pointless and it's tiring. Do you think that if there was any other alternative to salvation, God would have sent his son Jesus to be beaten and mutilated and murdered upon a cross? Do you think if there was any other way of coming to God, it would have been necessary for Jesus' flesh flesh to be ripped and for his blood to be spilled? There was no other way. There is no other way. There is no other alternative. God sent Jesus because he knew that if it was up to us to get to where he is, nobody would be there. So he came down to us in the flesh, in the person of Christ, so that we might be saved that Christ is the end of the law means that we cannot establish our own righteousness apart from bowing our knee to Jesus in faith. It was because they would not submit to him that the unbelieving Jews stumbled, and it's because they won't surrender to Christ that every unbeliever stumbles. Jesus is either the stone we will stumble over, or he's the savior that we will set our lives upon. My prayer is that each one of us in here will have chosen to set our lives upon him. Our most zealous pursuit should be Jesus. Pursuing him leads to salvation. Pursuing him gives rise to compassion. Pursuing Jesus brings about knowledge. And pursuing him results in freedom. Let's bow in prayer.